Yep. Welcome, Mario. All right. So, so hello everyone. My name is Mario, and I'm going to present this this talk called "Visualizing the Solar System with Blender." These are the points of my talk. First, a little bit about me and things that matter to this to this topic. Then I'm going to talk about Blender and its use in science. Mainly, what is Blender? What is photorealism? Um, what is procedural procedural generation? Which are the two great advantages of working with with Blender in this topic. And finally, some conclusions. So about me, first I studied astro uh, physics with astrophysics in Madrid. And in 2014, I did my Erasmus traineeship in Tartus Observatory. I worked, uh, I live right there in the observatory on the top floor. I don't know if somebody's there now. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun work and learned a lot. And that's where I, I was studying only pure physics. And I got a bit jealous of people going around with satellite parts and designing things and coding stuff that was going to end up in space. So that's what made me change a little bit my, my, my path. So after that, I went to Barcelona and I studied a master's degree in aerospace science and technology. Um, and I did another Erasmus traineeship um, at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne. Here's me pretending to fly around in the Columbus um, replica. Um, Right now, I'm working as an independent contractor at the Institute of Geology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Actually, I'm, I'm in Barcelona, but I'm working remotely. Um, in this talk, I will explain what I'm doing there and what is what is its relationship with Blender. Um, my path with Blender, first, I will talk more about what Blender is, but it's a 3D modeling software um, that is meant for art but can have some uses in science and technology. So I discovered Blender in 26 or 27. I picked some in some hard drives and found some of my first uh, projects with Blender. This is what I did in these days. I was 17 or 18. Um, I remember being so happy about this planet. It's awful if I was in the texture of Mars with colors changed. And a blue sphere on top, and that's it. But I thought it looked amazing. But anyway, I learned this on my own, never got me anywhere. Um, I never thought it would, so I forgot about it until last year when Manish contacted me so I could maybe help with uh, the CISPA project. Um, they are Blender, um, they were using Blender as part of CISPA. So I went back to the Red Line where I what I knew, I started with the tutorial that you have to do if anybody wants to start with Blender, which is making a donut. We can share the link later if you, if you want. So I did the donut and then started getting a bit better. I collaborated with CISPA and also did some things on my own. I can say I got better and I got better at making planets. Look at that planet I made after watching Melancholia, those volumetric clouds and correct atmosphere and everything. So it came a long way. Um, and the thing is that uh, I really learned Blender for just one project, and then I continued as a hobby and learned a lot, and I never thought that it would be useful. But eventually, they needed someone for in the Czech Academy of Sciences for working on asteroid modeling and simulation with Blender, and that's how physics and donuts can land you a job. Um, if I can give a mid-talk conclusion about this, is just if you don't know what to do, just learn whatever, and maybe someday it will be useful. And if not, well, you never know. Maybe, maybe at some point. So, what is Blender exactly? Blender is an open source 3D software that is, this is important, it's designed with artists, artists in mind, not science. We are scientists are using it as, um, we are getting into it, but it's not meant for us. Uh, that's important to have in mind. On the right, you can have, take a look at the, the interface. It's million buttons. Um, part of a scene I made for 
for the space travel block. Um, one of the most important things for us for Blender is that it claims that it can achieve photorealism. And now is the question of, of there's the question of what exactly photorealism means. Because um, there are several 3D software and 3D rendering engines, and they all claim to be photoreal, but they have their difference, their differences. So which one is photoreal? Photoreal is not that it looks exactly as real life. It, it, it means that it to the it looks the same to the eye, but there are differences. You have to take into account that. All models are just approximations, and a simulation or a rendering is a model, which is an approximation. So there are several ways of doing the same thing, or you can, depending on the application, you can get uh, more precise, or maybe you don't need that much precision. So when this kind of servers claim that they are photoreal, mostly they are talking about ray tracing, which means that they calculate individual rays of light from the light sources to the camera and they take into account their reflections and how they change um, in color and in direction in order to generate the image. Also, the capturing real effects of the light makes it photoreal, but some, some softwares are more capable than others. Maybe one of them can render the light passing through the to the water of the oceans and creating caustics on the bottom and the other cannot, not, but both will be photoreal. And another important part of this photorealism is like they can simulate realistic material properties like materials that are um, and glow, that glow, that are transparent, that are reflective, that simulate skin, all of that. So Blender has all of that. But yeah, the, it is an approximation, so there are different ways of doing it or different parameters that you have to take into account. For example, this image I found from some, from some question on the internet of a guy that went there, the thing on the left, and he felt that the materials weren't real enough. This is the famous donut, by the way. So he he felt that it wasn't real enough, especially on the cap of the on the back that should be transparent. And then he realized that Blender, by default, it just calculates that each ray of light bounces at maximum one time, and then it disappears. If it bounces two times, it disappears. And that's not what happens in real life. So he, he changed that to 124, and then it became more realistic. But then it is mostly the same, but the plate is a bit different and the cap is different. But we just say that the one on the left is not photoreal because of that. It is still photoreal, right? It, to the untrained eye, or if you will look there exactly, it is real. The one on the left is more real. Yeah, right. It is. Anyway, this, if you are working with art, this maybe doesn't matter that much. But if you are working with science, you have to be really careful. Maybe that those rays that disappear after just a couple of bounces are important for whatever calculation you are making. So if you plan to use Blender for precise um science you have to be really really careful with this and many other things so um here are some some examples of when blender works for science um, space science and technology when can you use it freely without worrying too much one of the examples is for the work we did for the space travel work if you haven't seen the link um, you can Google space travel blog, and we can share the link in the chat, me. But we made a. Oh, yeah, don't worry, I'm sharing the links. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we, we went for, we made a solar system flyby video uh, for the, the blog and for CISPO. And for this, we went with a kind of photo reel with a lot of artistic uh, licenses on the way. But yeah, I, you know, I used real textures for Jupiter, for the Earth, there's volumetric clouds. That's a picture of the moon slapped on a plane, on a plane so it can, can be more realistic, right? Um, but then there are some, uh, yeah, some artistic choices because it was meant for, not for 
the complete photo realism, but also for the promotion of video. So press that balance back for that. Then there is perfectly good. Another example for from the guys at CISPO, you can see here on the right a real image of comet 16P and on the left a rendering of this same comet with the gas uh, rendered in Blender. So well it's not exactly the same, but it is very realistic and for a lot of purposes this is perfectly fine. So if you don't go very, very deep into what the exact molecules are doing, Blender is perfectly fine for this kind of renderings. And another example will be my work of this last year at the, the Institute of Geology. I've been working on asteroid image generator. If you have a better idea for the name um, all years, but what it does is it uses um, a series of scripts plus Blender so you can ask for certain images of um, asteroids or common nucleus, and you can select the camera position, sun position, the material of the asteroid, if it has rocks or not, a lot of parameters. Um, you can, it can render automatically the images for you with very decent realism, I would say. This is 67P, and here you can have an example of the uh, asteroid Bennu. With also there's some improvements here in procedural generation that I will talk about later. But yeah, this is not completely perfect, but you can click the eye at some point at some with some examples. And for our purposes, this is perfectly fine. On the left, you can see a simulated flyby of 67 p It's very small because it was simulating a specific comet interceptor pass. And the closest approach would be a thousand kilometers. There's the closest pass, but at this level of realism and for space planning, these kind of renderings are perfectly fine. On the right, you have my current project, which is training a neural network, so it can identify, uh, it can take a series of observations of an asteroid and rank them in the. Uh, from best, best to worst, um, is if check if they have blur, if they are um, off center, and etc. The idea is that a CubeSat can take several pictures, learn and know by itself which ones are the best images, and send those to the main spacecraft and then to Earth. And for this purpose, we'll be retaining hundreds of images of asteroids. Um, with different elevation conditions and angles and everything. This also is perfectly fine for a perfectly fine job for Blender. Uh, but there are some points where you have to be careful when using Blender. Mostly it has to do when you have when you want to use realistic units, you have to be really careful because in theory Blender works with real units. And distance and also illumination and power and etc but you, because here's the important here's when the fact that blender is designed with artists in mind comes to it's very important because if you want precision in the units you need to be perfectly sure that if the lamp for example is telling you that it's outputting 100 watts for example you need to make sure that there's nothing in between that is changing that, because if people, developers or Blender have to make a choice between complete realism and something that looks good for art or something that works, they will probably choose that it looks good, even if it means changing some parameters or some um, power of the lamp or whatever. So if you want really, really precise, uh, units, the best option is to do it afterwards. Like render in Blender, whatever you need, and also render some calibration images, maybe with with using uh, um, diffuse white disks in the same conditions as the asteroid, and then afterwards you can take those images and calibrate them. Anytime you need precision, you you'd better do it afterwards, unless you want to check 
the code of Blender, which you could because it's open source, but unless you want to check and make super sure that Blender is not doing anything wrong with the images, then you are better do it on your own. Um, and also you have to make sure that there are no hidden effects in Blender that you didn't take into account and they are changing your effect, your result. For example, if you export as PNG and some value is above 255, then it will be burned, but maybe you don't notice. Or here on the right, you can see that a project we did last year that it was, we tried to implement some uh, real photometric functions of asteroids in Blender. Um, well, I did, I put the, uh, the equations where it's where they should. These are four examples of four different parametric functions in an asteroid. And you can see the effects of in opposition when, when the light is wide outside the camera, you can see that darkening in the center than we expected. But recently, my colleague, uh, Antti Pentila, thought that, wait a second, so there's these equations that they are correct. But then in Blender, you have to connect them to, a, let's say, a blank material, but then it's connected to a rendering engine. And he suspected that that blank material was adding a cosine to the calculation. Um, actually, it looks like it does. So if we, at the start, we were not even thinking that there was a cosine there, we thought that it wasn't doing anything. But turns out that it does. Um, and it was hard to notice. So. Yeah, you have to be pre-check everything in post-processing when you want realistic effects just to avoid this either this or dug into the code. So um, the second big important thing that Blender can do and it's very useful for for space science and technology is procedural generation. The word procedural means something that is created using algorithms instead of manually right so the advantages of procedural generation are many one of them is that you can generate automatically large amounts of detail for example the image of asteroid Bennu that i showed before i didn't put all those rocks in their place manually it happened with an algorithm and that meant that that would have been impossible but doing it manually also, that way you can add randomization really easily. Humans are very bad at randomizing things. So if, even if you try to put rocks, scatter rocks around an asteroid in a random way, probably you are not being as random as you think. And also it can be easily modified afterwards. If you think that the rocks are too big or too, too small, or you want more, or you want fewer rocks, you can change that with a number. If you did all that work manually, then you will have to manually fix it again. And procedural generation can be done right now in two aspects, in shaders or in geometry. A shader, in short, is a, the function that defines what the light does when it bounces off a material, if it changes color, if it changes direction, if it goes through, etc. And that can be modified procedurally. And in geometry, it means changing the the mesh itself of the object with an algorithm or adding other objects on top. I will explain more in a moment. So for example, one advantage of what was procedural generation in my work would be this. On the left, you can see an image of asteroid Bennu. And this is a real image, a mosaic composed of several images. And there's some model going around of asteroid Bennu, a 3D model which comes from a laser scan or something like that, that is very, very detailed down to the very small rock. Um, the model is so big that it's even, you cannot even open it in one part, it's divided it's in several parts. Um, well, it's huge and complicated. And on the right is an artistic representation of what you have to my computer. If I try to open that, that's not feasible. Um, but then there's the question of, do you really want that? Do you really, if you are modeling, mm, so we are, we are using Bannu as an example because it's one of the asteroids that we visited. So we are using it as a placeholder for future asteroids that we are going to visit, but we don't, we don't have any model yet, but we are pretty sure that they will look closely like this. So we don't need a model of Bennu with every tiny rock exactly how it is and in its place. 
we have modeled Bennu with a similar um, similar amount and type of rocks scattered around, right? So it doesn't make sense to get a supercomputer to be able to load this. Instead, what we've been doing is getting a very low resolution model. On the left, you can see another model of asteroid Bennu, the same as before. It's on an, a NASA website. It's, they publish it there, so you can 3D print it and put it in your room. So it's not very, very precise. So we took that and we added procedurally generated detail on top. Um, that way you get the thing on the right, which is not exactly as the real thing, but the distribution of sizes of the box are very close to the real thing. It's realistic enough for our purposes. And also if, if we get closer to, to our objective after and the asteroid we're going for, in this case, Didymos. Um, we see that the rock distribution is very different to Venus. We can change it afterwards with just changing a couple of numbers. Um, also, this is much, much lighter than the other thing. This is our, actually, I modeled nine boxes, I think, and they are all the same nine boxes scattered about the surface with random size and rotation. Um, you cannot tell that it's the same nine rocks. So you save a lot in, in memory um, and everything. So this is much more lightweight and it can't make the same thing. And the other way you can do this is with shaders, as I said. And this is also from, from CISPO. And this is the, so on the right, you have a plane with no detail, just a plane. Um, the detail is introduced as a shader. So as I said, the shader defines how the light bounces off of this plane, and you can use some tricks to control how that light works. Um, you can fake detail, but it's not. This is a technique that is used a lot in video games, for example. So on the left, you can see several, there are more. You can see some grayscale maps. On the top left, you can see that with algorithms, uh, um, Mikkel made some uh, shapes that look like craters. In the center, you can see some kind of scratches. On the bottom, you can see some high frequency detail with like white noise and everything. So then you get those maps, um, you put them in the shader, you tell the shader to interpret uh, the difference in from black to white as differences in height. Um, the resulting shader is what you see on the right. Although that detail is not actually on the surface, it's, let's say, fake. But when a ray hits, for example, the rim of a crater, you are telling it, make it so that um, bounce in a way that it looks that there's a crater there. So you are, in a way, um, creating detail where it's not procedurally, and also keeping the mesh low detail. So it works faster. So here are my conclusions of using Blender for this kind of topics. So the first would be that it's very easy to learn the basics. There's a very big community, so you can have you can find tutorials everywhere basically. It's probably more accessible than programming yourself, your own rendering engine, or using OpenGL. And if you get results faster with Blender, instead of having to code and spending some time before you get your first Hello World image, let's say. And so it's open source, so first you can use it for anything you want without having to worry about licensing. And also, if, if you want, you can be into the code, see how things are done, maybe contribute to it. Um, also, it's very powerful in the procedural generation and it's getting better and better. Although scattering of rocks that I've shown didn't exist last year, something very new. So, so yeah. And um, the biggest con of all is that you have to stay vigilant all the time. You cannot leave your car down because maybe somewhere Blender is doing something that is changing your, your results. Where you don't want to, um, you kind of you have to check 
all the time, check your results afterwards and see if what you're getting from Blender is not only pretty and good for some things, but also it has realistic image, uh, realistic values and data and all that. So that's it. Thank you. And I'm open for questions if you have to. All right. Thanks a lot, Mario. Um, I'll stop recording.